So we're going to talk about temperature and heat. And you are familiar with these, the colloquial definitions of these terms already, but we're going to talk about the, uh, the technical definitions and how you apply these to describing your surroundings um, with, in mathematical language. So we will start by uh, talking about what it means to measure something's temperature and what it means to be in equilibrium. So when you have a thermometer and you are measuring something's thermometer, that thermometer reaches equilibrium with the object that you're measuring. What that means is that the average energy of the molecules and atoms inside of the of object A, of the thermometer A, are the, uh, on average the same as those in B. So, uh, so what's going on microscopically is that the atoms and molecules in B are colliding and interacting with the molecules and atoms in, in A until they've had enough collisions that on average they have the same amount of energy. Um, and when, you, when that's true, you will actually get the, um, the correct temperature. And this is part of why if you take some thermometer, it usually takes a while for the, um, for the thermometer to reach the, the point where it, it's giving you an accurate reading. Um, when we talk about a and B, B, uh, sorry, B and C being in thermal equilibrium, what that means is that B and C, the atoms and molecules in B and the atoms and molecules in C, also have roughly the same amount of energy on average um, as each other, and then again as the therm thermometer. So um, if B and C are in equilibrium with each other, if you move the thermometer from A, from B to C, the reading will stay the same. That is thermal equilibrium. And what is happening microscopically is that the average energy of all of the molecules and, and atoms, each individual molecule and atom is, is on average the same in each of these objects. Now note that I said on average that there can be, there are distributions. So you don't have the same exact energy for everything, but on average they're the same. When we use temperature, we measure the temperature in the, the if you live in the United States, you have, uh, become accustomed to the Fahrenheit scale. Um, this is mostly used in the United States. Um, and the rest of the world largely uses Celsius. Um, and in the Fahrenheit scale, the zero, uh, I, I actually don't remember where zero is, freezing, why zero was set there. The freezing point of water is at 32 degrees. Um, and the boiling point of water is at 212 degrees. Fun fact, uh, the, there is a natural vary, so normal body temperature is 98.6 Fahrenheit. Uh, the, uh, the, there is some variation in people's regular body temperature, and Fahrenheit's wife's body temperature was at 100 far degrees Fahrenheit, and that's why 100 degrees Fahrenheit was set there. Also happens to be approximately the same as the rectal temperature of a, cow, of a cow, and I heard somewhere that that was why it was. I looked it up. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, but in case you ever you need some way to memorize it, hopefully that will stick out in your head. Um, now, Celsius, zero degrees, is the point at which ice melts and becomes water. And then 100 degrees uh, Celsius is the point at which um, water boils and becomes steam. So the Celsius, uh, the, the zero and the 100 degrees Celsius are set at a very specific point. We often also use the temperature scale Kelvin. Now, Fahrenheit and Celsius are degrees and Kelvin, so it's degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, but it's simply Kelvin. Um, Kelvin, the, it turns out that the um, temperature in Kelvin is proportional to things such as that average speed for molecules and atoms. And if you extrapolate it back to the, um, if you extrapolate the, it back to where the point where all molecules and atoms have no energy, you reach the zero point. Um, and so the zero is fixed like that, and the, uh, the scale is set by the, um, the scale is set to be this, where one Kelvin is the same as one degree Celsius. One small correction, technically it's not the number of the energy in each, um, in each atom or molecule, it's the energy in each degree of freedom of, 
molecular atom. We'll get to the, the exact, uh, what that exactly means later on. Okay, so thermal expansion, you may have noticed that, or you may not have, different uh, objects expand and contract um, more or less depending on what they're made out of. So if you have, for instance, a balloon and you stick a balloon, you blow up a balloon, you stick it in the freezer, it is going to shrink pretty significantly. Now, gas happens to expand and contract rather, uh, red, rather significantly with, uh, with, the, um, with temperature. Solids tend to expand and contract a lot less. So if you stick that balloon in the freezer, you're going to be able to see visually that it is a lot smaller than it used to be. Whereas if you take a frying pan and stick it in the freezer, it's colder, but it looks like, once it's frozen, it's colder, but it looks like it's the same frying pan. It doesn't appear to have contracted. Mi microscopically, what's happening is that it really is shrinking ever so slightly, and almost everything is going to shrink as it gets colder. Um, so this actually causes a lot of different effects. Um, so different metals expand and cool at different shapes, but basically everything expands slightly when you heat it up. So for instance, when you put your oven on a cleaning cycle, all of the metal in it expands. And this is why you should not leave the, the, um, the trays in the oven if you run it on the self-cleaning cycle because it gets so hot that the trays will actually expand so much they warp the oven. I did that to my oven. Oops. Um, there are other times that comes in effect, in, into account. So you may have at some point set a hot, um, set a, set a hot glass on uh, in a pool of water, and then it cools down very rapidly. It will shatter. Or you might put, uh, if you put gla regular glass into boiling water, um, it, it can shatter um, because glass expands and contracts rather significantly with temperature. Um, there is a special kind of glass called tempered glass, which, uh, which can handle this. It's more robust and, and does not expand and contract nearly as much. Um, and here you can see an example. So if you want something, a, a solid, which can actually measure uh, a temperature, one way to do that is that you have a strip of two different metals. One of the metals expands a lot more rapidly. In, in this case, this strip expands more rapidly with temperature than this strip. So at a given temperature, they might be the same length, but later, but at a higher temperature, this one is longer, and that's going to lead to the, the strip getting curved. And then you can use that, you can actually use that to measure changes in temperature. Um, we quantify the changes in, uh, in length uh, using a coefficient of thermal expansion. So you can write delta L equals alpha L delta T. And so this is a property of the material itself. Um, and typical, so if you look up the, your textbook has a number of different examples, uh, and you can look up the um, coefficients of thermal expansion. If we take gases are something like 3,400, times 10 to the negative 6. Oh, that, sorry, that is not a coefficient of linear expansion. Forgive me. Um, you can take something like, here, here's a good one since I mentioned glass. Regular glass is 9 times 10 to the negative 6 um, per degrees Celsius, and tempered glass is 3 times 10 to the negative 6 Per degrees Celsius. So tempered glass, like uh, like what you see in Pyrex cookware, is going to have one third of this the length expansion and contraction with temperature that regular glass does, and that's what makes it uh, less likely to break. It doesn't change the size as much with temperature, and then you can look at something like uh, aluminum it has a rather large 
coefficient. That is 25 times 10 to the negative 6 per degree Celsius. So aluminum expands and contracts rather significantly with temperature. Now, we can also talk about volume expansion. And if you have something, uh, so here you have a cube of some type of material, and you're going to look at how much it expands. Um, and, you know, imagine, so we quantify how much that expands. The change in volume equals alpha, or sorry, equals beta times the volume times delta P. So this has the same form as the previous equation. Um, and then you can talk about the, these coefficients. We can look at some examples. So for gases, we have numbers that are on the order of 3,400 times 10 to the negative 6 per degree Celsius. And then you have something like quartz crystal, which is 10 to the negative 6 per degree Celsius. So a gas is going to expand 3,500 times more with the same temp change in temperature as quartz. Um, how do we get that? Now, you'll notice if you read your textbook that, uh, that in general, beta is about three times alpha. Where does that come from? Um, if you take your, now you can ignore this if you don't, if you want to just um, plug through the equations, but so that you know where it comes from, if you take an object that is a cube, your volume is equal to your length cubed. And now we're going to say that the change in length is equal to, um, we'll use the first equation, alpha times the length times delta t. And then we're going to write the volume is equal to the length, so the, sorry, the change, the new volume, the new volume is the new length cubed. So the change in volume is equal to the new volume minus the old volume. This is, if I multiply this out, I am going to get L cubed plus Um, I get L cubed plus 3L delta L squared Let's see. 3L delta L squared plus 3L squared delta L minus, or sorry, yeah, and then, sorry, plus delta L cubed and then I have my minus L cubed. Now, this delta L is very small. So I am going to keep only the highest order. So these terms cancel out. And I have 3L squared delta L. plus 3L delta L squared plus delta L quantity cubed. All right, we're talking about numbers on the order of 10 to the negative 6th. So 1 millionth, whatever the length is, 
my change in length is one millionth the original length. So I square, so this term is on the order of one millionth, and this term is on the order of, um, this term is on the order of one trillionth. So um, this is tiny. This is minuscule. So I am going to say that this is approximately 3L squared delta L. And this, I can write this is, so my change in volume is going to, e is go my volume is going to change three times faster than my length changes. So my coefficient out in front is going to be instead of um, alpha, it's going to, when I'm looking at volume, my volume is going to change three times faster. This is why the coefficient of volume expansion is basically always three times the coefficient of linear expansion. Now, what happens physically if you had that object, so we're going to imagine a cube, now cut a hole out of it. If you cut the hole out, a hole out of it, the whole thing expands. So if you cut a hole out of it, the hole also expands. Um, so that uh, just as if the plug were, just as if the hole were not there. So if you have something that is, um, if you have a metal and you, you want to make, there's a couple problems in the textbook where you have a metal and you have a hole in it, you want to make some peg fit really, really tight you can heat the entire thing up, put your, your screw or your peg in, and then let it cool down. Um, it will, this is a, the, the hole inside will actually be larger when you heat the system up. Okay, now a lot of things change with temperature. So here you can see the, um, the density of water is a function of temperature. So that's also telling you how much something, the volume of water is changing with temperature. Here you can see it's actually got a, it's got a maximum. So as you increase the temperature, at first you're increasing density and then the density starts to decrease. Now, of course, this shows some sort of, the graph makes it look like it's dramatic. Always look at the units over here. So this is the density of water in grams per centimeter cubed. You, you reach, you know, the number that we have in the back of our head is always about one gram per centimeter cubed. Uh, note here that even at its most dramatic point, you're talking about changing by less than, by, let's see, this is half of, so this is 0.05 percent. So you have a teeny tiny change in the actual density of water with temperature but you still actually do get slight changes in density of water with temperature. And you will see if you look at, um, at what the a material's properties are with temperature, you will see that many of them have, have changes with temperature. Now, equilibrium. We've already come up with a few different, we've used the word equilibrium in a few different ways this semester. Whenever we're talking about equilibrium, we're always talking about things, the average properties of things not changing. So you can have something which is in um, static or dynamic equilibrium. It, when you talk about equilibrium for um, large objects, the properties stay the same on average. That doesn't mean nothing's happening. It just means that on, the, on average, uh, the average properties are staying the same. So if you talk about something being in thermal equilibrium, that does not mean that it's not that there's no energy transfer between two things. It's just that if you're looking at A and B being in equilibrium, the amount of energy flowing from A to B is exactly equal to the amount of energy traveling from B to A. That's what equilibrium means. So here, if you have, say, a, a can of soda sitting, um, sitting uh, next to a can, of, next to some ice or sitting in a cooler, um, they are, uh, they are in equilibrium when they both have the same temperature. There is actually some energy transferred from the ice cube to the, the can of soda and by, back um, the other direction. It's just that when they're in equilibrium, the amount, of, uh, the amount of energy transfer is the same in both directions. 
Okay, and um, now at first when we discovered, when we started describing um, how things change, it wasn't obvious that heat and work were the same thing. Um, we knew what temperature, you could measure a temperature. We had a qualitative sense of what a temperature was, but we didn't actually know that it was tied to the, um, the average speeds of molecules. Um, so at some point, they actually did you know, measure the equivalence of heat and work. So um, here you can see Joule's experiment, where uh, you had masses pushing down on a cylinder of gas. And so because you had masses, you had objects moving, you were doing work on the system. And you could, um, therefore, you were doing work and you could measure a temperature increase. Sorry, this was water, not gases. You could measure a temperature increase as you did work on the thermometer. Um, and what he found was that the temperature increase was proportional to the amount of work, demonstrating that mechanical work and heat, as was measured in the early chemistry experiments, was actually the same. They were the same thing. So heat and work are the same thing. They are both forms of energy. We did not always know that. Um, it's very easy when you look at things in a science textbook to just go, oh, well, oh, of course that's it. Or I'm told that's it. At the beginning, people didn't, couldn't assume any of that and had to work it up from, uh, from the beginning. And here you can see you know, smoking brakes on a truck are evidence that you, know, you have mechanical equivalence of heat. Um, if you guys have ever driven in the mountains, you guys may have noticed these things called truck ramps, runaway truck ramps. Uh, don't go in them if you are not a runaway truck, because it, what, what it is, it, it is it, it, sometimes the, the brakes on these trucks can burn. They get so hot when the trucker is um, going down the mountain, he has to push so hard on the brakes that the brake pads burn off and there is no brake pad anymore. If, you, if you're driving in the mountains and you smell your brakes, you're in trouble. Um, be very careful. Um, by the way, if you have a manual, you can downshift, it helps. Um, try not to get there in the first place, but if your brakes burn out, you no longer can stop. That's what the runaway truck ramps are for because now you can't stop and it is a big hill of sand so that you will, you steer into the sand and you go up the hill and your, the, the truck tires get stuck in the sand so you have a lot of friction with the road in order to stop that truck because otherwise a runa runaway semi truck is very dangerous. Um, so physics applicable to life, um, so you might not always see, I've never seen smoke. I've usually smelled the smoke before I've seen it. Also, if you're driving an RV, usually truckers know how their trucks operate sufficiently well to avoid the biggest problems. Whenever I've seen it, it's usually been RV drivers whose brakes are burned out. Okay, phase transitions. You guys have heard a little bit about this. So um, when you have, different phases of matter. We have three main ones that we talk about. As I mentioned in passing in another lecture, there is a fourth called a plasma, which we're not talking about. Um, we're still stuck in classical physics land um, and without electricity and magnetism. We have a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So in a solid, the atoms and molecules are very close together so that the, the separation between the different atoms and molecules is typically on the order of the size of the atoms and molecules themselves. So it might be a few times the, the diameter, but it's generally about the size, it's on the scale of the atoms and molecules themselves. As you heat the system up, the, um, you end up with the atoms and molecules being a little bit further spread apart. Um, they're, they're still very close to each other. They're still generally in contact with each other. The um, the, separate, the average separation between atoms and molecules is still on the scale of the size of the atoms and molecules themselves, um, except that now, over here in the solid, they were more or less bound in place. So they, they would move within one times the distance of their, uh, one times their size. They would be somewhere around here, close to where they started. Now, they're still interacting heavily with other atoms and molecules, but 
which specific atoms and molecules it is changes an awful lot as it moves around. Um, and this is called a liquid. Um, and then as you, ex as you heat the system further, the, so these, uh, in a solid, there's very little kinetic energy in atoms and molecules. In a liquid, there's more. You heat the system for more, you're adding a lot of energy to the atoms and molecules, and they want to dance. They start moving around and bouncing off the walls. Um, it's like a room full of toddlers. So then you've got the, the average separation between the atoms and molecules in a gas is much larger than the sizes of the atoms and molecules themselves. Um, these are the three standard phases of matter that we're going to talk about um, in this class. Um, and as you go from the, this phase to that phase to that phase, what happens is that you're adding energy so that, you're, so that the molecules start moving more and the average separation distance increases as you add energy to the system. We have something called a phase diagram where we plot the, um, the phases as a function of, you, there's, you can plot different things on the axes. A standard way of plotting it is where you've got pressure on one axis and you have temperature on the other axis. So, um, what, so here what you have is, this shows where you've got different phases. So typically here you would have at Standard temperature and pressure, that, that is one, at, this is an atmosphere, so one atmosphere. At very low temperatures, you have an ice. If you increase the temperature, you get to water. If you increase it more, you get to water vapor. If you have higher pressure, um, what happens under higher pressure is that the you start making ice at lower temperatures. So, um, so this transition moves back a little bit. So, you're, so at very high pressures, the, um, the freezing point of ice will be a little bit less than zero degrees Celsius. As you go to lower pressure, um, what happens is that you will get a, you get a triple point where you actually um, go directly from a solid to the vapor. There is no liquid phase anymore. Um, so this, and, and then there's a line. So if you are at sufficiently low pressure, you just don't have enough pressure to keep the molecules. Uh, um, this is for water specifically. You just don't have enough um, pressure to keep the mo water molecules close together. We spend a lot of time, uh, time in our regular lives dealing with the, the consequences of the phase diagram of water. Now, this is, most, this is what you need to know for most of this class and for high school physics, but I just want to flash for you. This is the detailed phase diagram of water, um, and there are 16 different phases of ice. You probably didn't realize that. Um, that, that that's different differences in the molecular structure of ice itself. So it can form crystals in different ways, depending on how much pressure um, you put the water under. Um, and then here, so here where you have sublimation, you don't usually see sublimation of water, but you probably have seen sublimation of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide at standard temperature and pressure has a transition from a solid to a vapor. Um, and if you, so this is dry ice. So what you're seeing with dry ice is that you actually see it go directly from the solid to the vapor. To the, uh, so without passing through a liquid. Um, and, you know, you can have, so this is, these transitions from solid and vapor, they sometimes happen, they happen fairly regularly. This shows a picture of dry ice. Um, you also can get uh, frost forming on windows. This is when you have, the, have water in the air, um, hits a cold window, and it will freeze directly um, in, er, in going from a vapor into a solid um, without going through a liquid phase. Okay, so then um, this, 
the fact that you end up getting that the pressure matters. So if you have a closed conta container, um, you actually will end up with a, a lower boiling point because the water vapor is trapped inside. Um, so, uh, so that's why you want to close the lid to a pan if you want to get the water to boil a little faster. All right, so when we talk about taking something through phase transitions, we talk about, um, so this shows the temperature as a function of the heat you've added to a system. We're gonna talk about water because water is the most familiar. So if you have ice, you can have ice at a certain temperature. Um, it, the, the temperature of ice can change. It can be colder than the freezing point of ice. Um, and then if, if you take it out uh, and you're melting ice, what's gonna happen is that the, so you will get a layer of water. The water is in thermal equilibrium with the ice. So what happens as you add temperature, um, if you've got your little ice cube here, is that it keeps the water and the ice cube at the same temperature while gradually, let me use, yeah, we'll, we'll put in two ice cubes there. And then it will, it, will always, it will be roughly at zero degrees Celsius. And what happens is that the ice cubes shrink and shrink and shrink, but the temperature stays the same as you add heat from the surroundings. Um, so that uh, the temperature stays the same, you're adding heat. If you plot the temperature as a function of the heat added, you have a straight line here while you're going through the phase transition. Then once you get to a regular old cup of water, you can change the temperature of the water by adding heat. And, um, and you, have, you see that the temperature changes. It's directly proportional to the, um, to the amount of heat added. And then you reach the point where you have the boiling point of water as you add um, and then when you add um, heat to the water, what's gonna happen, so when you're boiling water, it stays at the same temperature. Um, so this is gonna be at 100 degrees Celsius. When you start boiling, it's gonna be at 100 degrees Celsius when you've boiled half of it off um, as you're slowly forming steam. So the water and the steam are in equilibrium until you have added sufficient heat that all of the water is now steam. And then if you add heat, you can, keep, you can change the temperature of the steam. So if you plot the temperature as a, function of, um, as a function of the amount of heat added, you see that every time you have a phase transition, um, there's a plateau. We have two different equations to describe the different parts of this curve. When you, have, um, when you are not going through, a phase transition, then you have a specific heat. So the amount of heat is the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. So we have observed that when you are not going through a phase transition for most materials, the, um, the amount of heat it absorbs is directly proportional to the change in temperature. And this constant, is, this is a constant for different forms of matter. So for, uh, for liquid water, this C is one um, gram per degree, um, one gram per, sorry, one joule per, per, per degree, one calorie per degree Celsius. And then uh, the appropriate number is about 4,000 joules per, um, per kilogram Kelvin um, in SI units. So whenever you have something changing temperature and not changing phase, this is it. And when you have a phase train change, you have a mass times the latent heat of formation. And there is a, so there's a different specific heat for ice, water, and steam, and there is a different latent heat of formation
for water and steam. And if you are in my class, I always make my students calculate once the amount of heat going, from, going along a trajectory like this, going from changing the temperature of ice into um, melting the ice, adding the, uh, heating up the water, and then boiling the water off, and then changing it to steam. It is an exercise you should do once in your life. It's not necessarily so useful more times than that. All right, now we can talk about heat transfer. This is something that affects your daily lives. If you, uh, whether you're talking about living in, you know, living through winter or a hot summer, you're often dealing with heat transfer and trying to prevent it or trying to get more of it. Um, and if you have, so there's three different ways that you can have, uh, that you can have heat transfer. One of them is conduction. Conduction is the heat transfer that occurs when two things are directly in contact. So that ice cube in contact with a soda, that is conduction because the, the ice um, or the water in the ice um, does not go into the soda can. You're not, you're not exchanging any mass. It's simply that the two objects are touching each other and therefore um, they are gradually equaling gradually reaching thermal equilibrium. Um, you can also have convection. This is the movement of air. So if you open a window to cool a room in your house off, that is convection because there is an exchange of mass. Mass is coming, there's air coming in the house in one direction and air going out of the house in another direction. You can also get heat transfer through radiation. Um, and that does not require any, ex any contact or any exchange in, uh, in matter. So if you sit near a fire, but you're not actually touching the fire, that fire actually emits light at very low wavelengths. It hits you, that's what warms you up. Um, it hits you and it causes the atoms and molecules in your body to start vibrating more um, because it's it, because your body is absorbing that light. So that's radiation. So if you have something like you're sitting around a fireplace with an open window um, or you have leaks in your doors and windows, you will always have some leaks in your doors and windows. Um, you can have all three going on in your house at the same time. You can get air coming in through doors and windows and then going out through the fireplace. You actually need the air to go out through the fireplace. So you will always have some level of convection in your house because you've got air coming in and going out. Um, you get, uh, if you have a fire, you have some heat transfer through radiation because that fire is emitting, um, is emitting radiation that is actually warming you and the things around you up. And you can also get conduction where the fire is sitting on top of the fireplace and it is heating the, um, it is heating the hearth and this, this area gets warm. And actually, in Korea, they often use floor heating and they actually heat the floor underneath you instead of using, in the United States, we often use, um, we use central heating systems that blow air throughout the house. In Korea, they heat from below. Um, and you also, in, in a lot of Europe, you have radiators. So. Uh, all sorts of different things are standards. Um, and, well, the radiators don't only use radiation. They also use convection around it and some conduction to nearby things. So in a typical house, you, you usually have all three of them going on at the same time. And this shows how heat conduction works. So if you have two things in contact, what actually happens is that the all atoms and molecules in one hit the atoms and molecules in the other, and that leads to energy transfer between the different atoms and molecules so that they eventually reach the same average amount of energy per degree of freedom. Um, so it, it does matter how they're moving, but they a measure of the same energy um, in each different object. And it can occur through, um, it can occur through any type of material. Um, most materials conduct 
heat somewhat. Some of them conduct heat better than others. And your book has an equation for how rapid that heat transfer is. It basically says that it is so that heat transfer, the amount of heat transferred per unit time is proportional to the difference in the temperature between the two objects and to the area um, where they overlap and the separation um, between them. So then uh, there is some coefficient of, there is some coefficient of proportionality to describe how they change. So the greater the difference in temperature, the more rapid the heat transfer is going to occur. And then details of the geometry matter. You can have something called a gravity furnace where the um, where you end up, it, it creates a convective loop that heats the entire room. So you end up, you actually get the room to the, because hot air rises, hot air rises because it is less dense. So the, the air gets heated up and it will actually lead the air to flow in, um, to flow around the room, which heats up the entire room. As the hot air rises, it touches things that are cooler. It eventually cools off as it gets further from the furnace and cooler air is more dense, so it sinks and it ends up traveling back to the furnace. Um, and it also, this convection, where you end up getting liquids moving around because there's slight differences in the temperature and that leads to differences in the density. This is important, for instance, when you're considering how, uh, how water boils because the hotter wa water is less dense, um, so it rises to the top and the colder water sinks to the bottom where it can actually be heated up. Uh, you can prevent uh, heat transfer through insulation. And so an example of how insulation works is fur. When you have fur, um, it traps air inside of it. So inside of the fur, you end up getting small pockets of convection. Um, and that means that you can't get air. So you don't have air moving from outside all the way in. So you don't have transfer of air. It pre prevents, um, it can prevents convection all the way to the inside of the body. So this is how fur works to help insulate. Radiation is another special case. There is something called black body radiation. Um, and what this means is that any object that has a non-zero temperature, which is all objects, is going to emit light. Um, and when you hit modern physics, you're going to learn a little bit more about the, why this is such an awesome thing, um, because the, this actually led to, uh, this is one of the pieces of evidence for quantum mechanics, the sh exact shape of this spectrum. But when you have some object, it has, it emits light, and um, that is, so it's going to be the, the shape of this spectrum of light ch changes depending on the temperature. So that if you have something which is hotter, then it uh, has a maximum which is at lower wavelength than if you have something that is cooler. So if you are looking at a hot pan, you might see it to be red hot. Um, and uh, the reason you see it to be red, longer wavelengths we perceive as red, um, and it just doesn't have enough of these uh, of the blue and the um, blue and green light. You, you don't see them. The dominant thing that you see is red. Um, the sun is something that we call white hot because it looks white. Now, why does it look white? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, the uh, the sun um, actually the peak of the sun's light is in the visible spectrum, so that most of the light from the sun is in the visible spectrum. We perceive light, which is a roughly equal mixture of light in the visible spectrum, to be white light, even though it's actually a mixture of colors. 
course we evolved so that we could see visible light very well because most of the light that we get from the sun is visible light. Um, and so any object is going to radiate heat. When you're sitting in front of that fire, you are actually feeling some of the black body radiation from that fire. And this will also happen. You stand near your stove while it's on, you feel the heat from it, that is black body radiation because that stove is warmer than you. So it is emitting light, that light it is emitting radiation, that radiation hits you, you feel it, it makes the molecules in your body want to dance, so they all start, start vibrating more. That movement is what we perceive, that movement of molecules and atoms is what we perceive as temperature. The more something's moving, the, more, the higher temperature it is. Uh, so now you can have things that emit light better than others um, and things that reflect light better than others. Black uh, absorbs light much better than white. Um, we often make approximations that things that are black absorb all the light, but it's not all of them. Things that are white uh, reflect nearly all of their all of the light. Now, even any almost any white that we make is actually imperfectly reflective. There's been a big drive to make, for instance, very reflective white paint for painting this, the roofs of houses in hot climates, so that you do not need to so that they don't get warmed up by the sun and you don't need to spend as much on air conditioning. In cold climates, you want the opposite, or cold climates, or in winter, you want the opposite. You want your, um, your dwellings to absorb a lot of energy, so you might want them to be black. So if you have, um, and actually the color inversion here switched it so that this should be black, that it should be, that should be darker black, and this should be lighter lighter or whiter. Um, so the, if you put ice cubes on pavement, uh, on light pavement versus on uh, asphalt, the ice cubes on the asphalt are going to melt faster because the asphalt absorbs more light than the, pave, than the sidewalk. So in general, a black object is a good, um, is a good absorber. <laughs> Here's where the color inversion gets a little mixed up. This is black, that is white, so, or, or light. So something which is black will absorb nearly all of its light. Um, and when it radiates, it emits most, it ra ra emits most of its um, radiation. Um, something which is white um, will reflect most of, uh, of the light, but then its black body radiation will largely be retained. So a black object is a good absorber of light and a good radiator, and a white or clear, or a white or silver object is a poor absorber and a poor radiator. Now we'll move to just a couple of examples. So here you can see a phase diagram for carbon dioxide. Um, and this shows um, the, this shows as a function of, so pressure here we are, this, this one atmosphere is roughly what we are in the regular world. And you see that it will undergo, there's a triple point up here at much higher pressure. This is solid, this is gas, th sorry, this is solid, this is vapor, this is liquid. So at standard temperature and pressure, as you um, increase something, so you will at negative 78 or so, um, you have the transition from degrees Celsius, you have the transition from a solid, uh, carbon, solid carbon dioxide to a vapor of carbon dioxide. Um, and you would have to go up five times atmospheric pressure. This is not, a, this is a zero suppressed scale. So five times atmospheric pressure to, e to even be able to see liquid carbon dioxide at all. That is to say that at standard, uh, standard pressure, you will always have carbon dioxide sublimating. Um, here you see a cutaway of a thermos bottle, which is known as a Dewar. Um, <coughs> the question is to explain the various parts and how they help the Dewar um, absorb, keep Keep the heat in. Okay, so if you've ever worked with liquid nitrogen, you've seen this canister that uh, looks 
a little funny from the outside. Um, it has on the it has on the inside a container which is typically glass. Glass is generally a poor conductor of heat, so you want something that does not conduct heat well. Um, you're going to put something cold, like you know this could be a thermos, it could be a liquid nitrogen door. You have some liquid you'd like to keep it at its um, at its standard temp at, at either hot or cold. If you use silvered walls, so the glass the glass is shiny on the inside, that means that whatever uh, whatever light this liquid emits, because it is a it is an always emitting light, because uh, everything emits light through black body radiation, whatever light emits the the silvered wall is going to reflect most of it and absorb very little. So you want to minimize, that's because you want to minimize the heat transfer from this liquid to the, um, to the inner container. And, and then you want to minimize the transfer of heat through the container itself to the surroundings. So you have a vacuum surrounding your glass bottle. When you have a vacuum, so you cannot, if, now there's never a perfect vacuum, there's always leaks, but if you ev at least remove most of the air, you're reducing the opportunity for heat transfer through convection because there's not much in there. So you can't get transfer, you, you can't get heat from the glass walls out to the edge of the container. Now, you want to have an outer container because you're trying to keep a vacuum, you want it ideally to be a little bit, you want silvered walls on the inside here because you don't want the heat to get transferred. You want whatever temperature this is. If any heat manages to escape this bottle, you want to at least keep it in the outer container. Um, and you need to have it centered so that this wall doesn't accidentally touch. You've got to have at least some contact between uh, the inner wall and the outer wall somehow here. You can't totally eliminate it, but you want to minimize it. Uh, a rubber support is going to help keep it, uh, keep it stable. And then you have your outer container. Now you need to be able to open it so you're going to have some type of stopper that's going to be imperfect, so there's going to be a few leaks. The opportunities for leaks are largely um, if this breaks and there's actually some more contact there, if your vacuum is imperfect um, so that there's really more air in there, um, if your rubber is actually conducting, will actually conduct at least a little bit of heat, um, if your reflective surfaces wear out and they don't work as well at keeping the light from radiation in, those are all things that can make your thermos or your nitrogen doer um, work less well than it did when it was shiny and new. All right, and with that, we're going to end this chapter and see you for the next one.